Hello, this is Margaret Frankhauser, and thank you very much for joining our session on Rethinking Aging. Aging is an issue of increasing importance in the United States and around the world. And I'll take you on a fast tour of what's happening in aging, and we'll talk about the impact on public health and on societies in general. So thank you once again for joining me. So I'm gonna start with a question really, and I just want you to ponder this for a minute. When I say the word aging, what do you think of? What images come to your mind? Just free think for a minute. What comes to your mind when I say aging? And hold that thought for just a minute. Now, second question. When I say the word old, how old is old to you? Attach a number to it. This is very personal. And I want you to answer as you would answer at your current age, not when you were five years old and not when you were 15, but what do you think is old today? So we're gonna move on from there. And we're gonna talk about what I hope to accomplish during a short presentation with you. We are, by the way, coming out of Older Americans Month. So this is a good time to keep aging in our frame. It's not just something we should think about once a year, but we need to think of consistently as we do our work at JSI and in public health in general. So our goals today are first to build your knowledge of aging, the demographics and society that frame us, and the demographics not just in the United States, but internationally. We'll describe trends that are occurring in the United States and globally and discuss their impact on public health. And we're going to talk about ageism and define patterns in our discourse and our practices and our thinking in society that contribute to ageism. And lastly, we're going to learn methods of framing aging in such a way that you can move ideas and policies and helpful efforts forward without people shutting down their thinking on you. So let's start with a slide everybody in the field of aging knows extremely well. We call this slide from pyramid to pillar and it's provided by the US Census Bureau. If you look at the um, graph on the left-hand side, this is age distribution in the United States in the year 1960. Think about 1960 and what was happening in 1960. If you look at this, you see this very narrow pyramid and you see, frankly, a lot of kids at the bottom. There are a lot of people under age 20 at the bottom of this pyramid and very few people in the top four slices of it, the ages um, 70 um, to 85 plus, there are very few people in that part of the pyramid. Now shift 100 years later to the right side of the graph, 2060, we haven't hit it yet, but we're, it's coming up soon. Um, and look at how it looks now. It's not a pyramid any longer. It's more like a pillar. And instead of having a large proportion of children at the bottom and very few older adults at the top, we now have this just very linear type graph in which there is a pretty even age distribution across um, five year cuts. What that means is by the year 2060, there will be significantly more people over the age of 50, 60, 70, and 80 in the United States. Now think of your age right now. If you're over age 21, you will be 60 or older in the year 2060. And I probably won't be here anymore because I'm in one of those lower quartiles. But, but the reason I point this out to you is we often think of the baby boomers as the issue here. That's why we see this aging in society is where there was this big birth cohort after World War II. And that was true. But the baby boomers are only the first generation to see this. They are certainly not the last. Everybody who comes after the baby boomers will see it in, in, in frankly, greater proportions than we see it today. So it's worth preparing ourselves for both personally and as a society. So we're going to take a look at that same graph for, for um, um, in a different way. And this time, we're just going to look at one 10-year cut. So this graph is looking at ages and, and the cuts are 2010 and 2019. So only a 10 year age spread. The 2010 are just those, those horizontal cuts that you now see um, framed in that dark black. And the green 
is the overlay of 2019. So look at what's happened in just a 10 year trend. We see fewer children from age birth to 20. In fact, fewer people from age birth to 25, but we see significantly more people from age 55 to 80. So we're seeing an aging of society in just a 10 year cut. And this is just in the United States. So the aging of society is accelerating. So why is it doing that? Well, it's, it's really good news. It's something to celebrate. The first in general is that there's a declining birth rate. And I don't know that that's celebratory, but I think that it does represent um, what happened in the last 50 years that now allows women and men to make choices about whether or not they will reproduce. So family planning, reproductive health, choices for women that allow them to be in the workforce, and cause them to limit the size of their families. So you can see in 1909, there were 127 births per 1,000 women. Uh, in 2012, it was 63 births per, per 1,000 women, and it has dramatically declined. I believe the most recent statistics came out last month, and we are in the neighborhood of 38 births per 1,000 women. That one is probably temporary and due to the COVID impact and, and um, the current climate. But overall, the birth rate is declining. And that is matched with advances in public health that allow us to live longer. So we have, we have great public health treatments, vaccines being among them, that allow people to reach adulthood and live to old ages. And we have good clinical medicine and treatments for heart disease and treatments for diabetes so that people live longer and the lifespan is generally longer. At the same time, we're seeing this lowering of the birth rate. So the United States is not alone in these trends. In fact, the trend is led by the nation of Japan currently. Over 25% of the people who live in Japan are over age 25 or older. And if you look at this map of the world, what you're seeing is not um, the percentage of people who are over age uh, 25. You're, you're seeing the median age, the midpoint age of nations. So you can see, if you look at the United States, that the midpoint is 37.6. The Canadians, on average, are older than we are in the United States. And look at where the older countries are. They happen to be generally in Europe. Um, so Spain, Germany, Poland, Italy, and certainly in um, Japan and um, some parts of uh, Southeast Asia. But frankly, in the entire world, the lifespan is increasing, and that is definitely something to celebrate. Now, in the United States, we're roughly at 15% of the population age 65 or older, and compare that to Japan with almost 26% of the population age 65 and older. So we're getting older, and the world is getting older. And by 2050, one-third of the entire population of the world will be age 50. And that is certainly not true today. What that means is that as a world, we have to think about adapting our systems, our, our public health systems, our social systems, our transportation, our housing, and how we engage in society to accommodate a population that is aging and will be proportionately older. Can they manage the way we have set up society? Can they manage housing? Are they capable of doing the things that are needed to navigate through society today with the construct of society? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So I skipped one. So what exactly is aging? And I, I know this seems like a simple question and yet, it has a lot to do with how we view aging. So what do we mean by it? Is it simply the accumulation of days and years? Is it a cultural model? How society views people who are older than others? Is it, is it a collection of experiences and activities and talents? There, or is it somehow related to a time frame that people are born in? We tend to use that a lot in the United States. We tend to use the term millennials and baby boomers and Gen Zers. And, and we think of them as cohorts that have commonalities as they move through a lifetime. But another question is, and on a much more physiologic level, is aging an accumulation of physiologic changes that 
ultimately lead to some decline in the ability to function. And if you were, if you were a, a um, scientist, you might identify aging as inflammation and shortening of telomeres. Telomeres are the tips of, of our um, DNA. And as those grow shorter, our lifespan grows shorter. So it's this progressive inability of the organs to repair damage over time. So when you think about aging, what frame do you think about it in? Do you think about it as days and years? Do you think of it as a functional issue? Do you think of it as a cultural issue? Or do you look at it as a scientist might look at it? So just to press that point, these are two 70 year old men. Now, when you think of two five-year-old children who are born without any genetic disorder, you don't see a great deal of difference in five-year-old children. And yet, look at the difference in these two men. Now, Mick Jagger is now older than 70, but this picture was taken when he was 70 years of age. And you can see this just stunning difference between he and the man on his left who looks vibrant and happy and doesn't have what we think of, right, as aging on his face. Mick Jagger, on the other hand, um, you know, could look to be 102 in this picture. So just being 70, that chronological age, that doesn't predict everything that we tend to think of as aging. The physiologist really looks at the difference between damage and repair. So when we are born, we are building cells at a far more rapid rate than we lose cells. We are losing them every day, even as a newborn. But we're building at such a rapid rate that we build and we grow in strength and volume as a human at a much faster rate than we lose. But somewhere between the age of 30 and 40, it depends on the organ system. And frankly, it depends on how people treat themselves and the circumstances under which they are born and are raised and stresses that they're exposed to. That, that there becomes eventually an imbalance between the damage and the repair. The damage might be accelerated by things like stress or smoking or trauma of some kind. Um, and the repair can be um, uh, diminished by disease, by age alone, and by habits such as um, alcohol or cigarette smoking. So when we start to see the repair fall far below the rate at, the, at which it's needed, then we start to see a decline in function and, and, and generally a decline in org organ function. But let's talk about this socially for just a moment, because I think that might be the most important perspective for all of us. How do we view aging in the United States? And we think of it as a frame of reference, really. Like, how do we as Americans think about aging? Well, there is an organization in Washington, D.C. that studies how Americans view social issues. And in 2015, they were funded to study how Americans view aging. The organization is called the Frameworks Institute. You might have heard of it, uh, of it. And they were funded by national organizations, including the American Society on Aging and the Gerontologic Society of America and AARP, as well as others, to study how Americans view aging. They interviewed over 12,000 people across the country, and they represented people in different age groups, different, in different racial and ethnic backgrounds, and in both urban rural and I should say suburban and all of those um, areas of society. And they posed a set of questions and then they tested messaging and associations with common words used to describe aging in the United States. So what they learned is two things, how we view aging determines how we respond to our own aging and to the aging of others. So the way we think about it, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, has a lot to do with our own fears about aging or how well we welcome aging and how we treat others who are aging and how we importantly treat issues around aging, especially if they involve some public discourse such as funding or altering the way we construct society to accommodate certain needs of people who are aging. So, the words we use are also associated with attitudes that we form, and many of them are subconscious. You know, we spent a lot of time in the last year in the United States 
really examining issues of systemic racism and how many of those things are ingrained. And one of the things they learned is that the same thing happens with attitudes about aging is they are learned over time. We don't consciously choose them, but they get reinforced so much through our behavior and our language that we have common attitudes in the United States. So here are their findings, the findings of frameworks. They found that there are two competing attitudes about aging. The one is that there are people who just enter their golden years and it's this perfect time where they now have the opportunity and the resources to relax and enjoy themselves. And you see these people pictured by investment firms and others and ads that encourage people to think ahead so that they too can be this happy golden couple. But an alternate view in the United States and perhaps the more common view in the United States is that aging is associated with low performance, frailty, dependency, and fading. Fading both physically and fading in such a way that we no longer matter in society or our opinion doesn't count or that we're overlooked in many ways. And just pause for a minute and think about the words that I've just used and how often you heard these words during COVID. Now that is not to deny that the majority of people who um, had serious, serious um, effects from COVID, including death, were older adults. And we'll talk about how those, how how one issue layers upon another. But the words that you commonly heard were frail, older adults. And that term was repeated so often that many of us walked away thinking, if you're old, you're dead in COVID. Um, and certainly many older people themselves feared it simply based on their age. The negative views have very serious psychological consequences, not just for society, but for us personally. If we personally take a negative view of aging, frameworks and others, um, in, including a terrific researcher by the name of, Re of Rebecca Levy at Yale, have identified that the risk for depression and suicide is markedly increased in people who have negative views of aging. They also have identified that Negative views of aging are associated with more rapid advancement of dementia and um, more rapid decline in Alzheimer's. They're also associated with stroke, job loss, and premature death. And they've controlled for the existence of those disorders in people ahead of time. So it's not just that once you have heart disease, you have a negative view of aging. But if you have a negative view of aging, you're far more likely to have heart disease. And in fact, a negative view of aging is associated with premature death. So let's think for a moment about some of the common language that's used in the United States. You know these terms. Frameworks identified them as well, and they tested some of these terms when they um, interviewed these 12,100 people. And words and terms that evoke negative imagery and negative beliefs were things like elderly, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, senior. So we think senior, that's an innocuous word, right? And yet, when they tested messages using the word senior as opposed to older adult, they they found that the people they were talking to had more negative associations with the word senior as opposed to older adult. Old folks, over the hill, retiree invoked this um, concept of people who were living off society and were no longer contributing to society. You know, that, that image of somebody who no longer is part of the economy of the United States. A silver tsunami is a, a highly charged term and they found that in their studies. I, mean, I don't know anyone who thinks of a tsunami as a positive thing. Even age wave, um, it was seen very negatively because people had images of these huge waves crashing on the beach, that this is a crash that's going to crush the rest of society. Grandma, grandpa, gramps, and granny, and I'm not talking about your own grandparents where you use that term to address them. I'm talking about people in public spaces referring to a stranger as gramps or grandma. I actually heard that just last weekend when I was grocery shopping, and it was intended to be a negative term. It was intended to diss somebody. Um, and so you can see how that can be used. Even boomer, and I know you're familiar with this, okay, boomer, it's a quick retort to put somebody in their place is saying, I know you're old. 
I know you're old, so get out of the way. Now, the, the context in which that, that term was coined was a terrible context on, on, on all sides. But the term boomer since that time has come to mean somebody who has an entitled sense, um, who, um, no, who really should no longer matter in society. So frail, geezer. And I want to talk for a moment about super senior and elder. Super senior is that person who, you know, is able to climb Mount Everest and in their free time forms a nonprofit organization that serves children in, in a developing nation. I mean, there are those people, they're wonderful, they do great things, but the rest of us really can't uh, relate to them because we're never going to accomplish that. Using those images of somebody who does just impossible things at the age of 80 has been found to be very negatively accepted. I mean, we're happy for them, but we know it's not us. It seems like it's an unachievable thing. So let's go back to that elderly and elder. Elderly, when used in public discourse, and particularly when used in policy statements, connotes very negative things. It connotes the use of financial resources, and it connotes people who aren't capable as opposed to the term elder, which is often used in societies. I, I think of, of um, um, Indian nations, I think of um, Asia, where the term elder in many religions, where the term elder um, connotes somebody who's mature and has knowledge of the topic. So elder in a particular context can be highly positive and elderly in the context of policy is, is um, assumed to be negative. So the prevailing notion of aging in the United States is highly negative. It's associated um, with, um, excuse me, I want to go back to that for a moment. It's associated with frailty. It's associated with disability. It's associated with expense. It's associated with loneliness and isolation. People think that even if they know people who are older adults, who aren't in that frame, who don't have those issues, still the notion in the United States is largely negative. And if you don't think that's true, ask yourself for just a moment, when was the last time you saw a cosmetic ad that celebrated aging? They almost never do. They almost always are anti-aging. You hear the term anti-aging very frequently because in the United States and in most Western nations, we are fearful of aging. Now, there are ways to get away from that and frameworks tested this as well. If we can support positive views of aging, we see that they're associated with feelings of happiness and contentment, lower rates of chronic disease, better ability to cope with change, greater satisfaction with work and life, and frankly, a longer lifespan. And the more people associate with those positive images and people who share those positive images, the better off they all are. So if you are seeing a healthcare practitioner, a physician, a nurse practitioner, a PA, who says to you, well, you know, of course your knees are bad, look at your age. Um, my suggestion is find a new practitioner because that person not only is not incented to help you, but they share a negative image of age. Remember the two 70 year old men? Just because you're 70 doesn't mean your knees hurt. There are ways to deal with that and it is not only age. Ageism is something that bears talking about here and it's pervasive. You know, more than 80% of people who are older adults have experienced some form of ageism in their everyday life. Ageist messages from marketers, um, jokes that people make about aging, even jokes we make about ourselves. I'm having a senior moment. It's just my age. Don't worry about it. I can't work on this computer. I'm too old to do that. Those messages reinforce ageism in our society. And Everybody experiences those. It's just ubiquitous, ubiquitous until we begin to internalize it ourselves. So then um, examples of ageism that I can share with you are here. And we all know that there are um, things that, you know, we all, we all appear, but imagine yourself going for a new job. I, I have a brother who's doing that, who um, was laid off during uh, COVID and his company closed. So he is now at age 60 looking for a new job. And he finds that all the algorithms just tease him right out. He's a very experienced person. He's a lawyer. 
there. He's very experienced, um, but he's having a hard time finding somebody to even give him a call back. So these are um, your retirement age. You're not going to give us many more years. I'm sure you're not capable of doing it. Um, this is a waste of time. You're not digitally capable. Capable. These are images we see all the time, particularly in work. But think about the last time you went to a card shop to get a birthday card and you're getting a card for somebody over age 60. They're almost all jokes about aging over the hill. And, and we buy them and we send them and we laugh. But ask yourself this for a moment. If you substituted the age for a race or an ethnic background or a disability, would it be funny anymore? And yet it is so common in the United States that we all do it and we think nothing of it. But think about one more thing, and I am a nurse practitioner by background, and I'll share this with you, that in healthcare, surveys have been done about asking older adults about the risk of STD, sexually transmitted diseases. The question almost never gets asked, almost never, because there's an automatic assumption that people don't have sex when they're over age 60, and, and they don't have it even if their, their partner died. No one bothers to probe. There are ageist messages throughout our society, including in healthcare. Let's see if I can get this to advance to my next slide. For some reason, it's not doing it. Let's see if I can move it on. But I will talk about um, other examples of ageism that, oops, hang on. Not sure why I'm stuck. Well, we um, what I will share with you without uh, here we are. Well, I'll share with you some words that we can use and some images that we can use to sort of reframe that. So, how can we take a, a prevailing cultural attitude and begin to turn that around? And one of the ways you turn it around are the stories that you tell and the frames in which you tell them and the words that you use. So instead of using negative metaphors, um, and the negative metaphors are things like, uh, this is a senior moment and I'm, I'm, I'm too old to understand technology. Think about the metaphor as one of ingenuity. We are a society that always works through our changes. And we are ingenious in the way we approach that. When, when the baby boomers were born, we figured we built more schools and we addressed them and trained them and created new scripts and new professions for them to enter. As more people age in society, as we age, not as they age, but as we age, how can we begin to create a society that is welcoming and accessible and participatory by people of all ages? We can use the momentum idea, which is as we age, we build in skills, we build in talent, we build in knowledge, and we are capable of sharing that knowledge with others in society so that together we can create a better society. And then there is also this frame of social injustice. And that is, we, we, can't, we can't afford to leave anybody out. Everyone in the society has talent. So we need to embrace everyone. And, and everyone means including people of all ages. So let's think for a minute about how those of us who work in public health, who work in policy issues, tend to think about things. We, we tend to ingrain social justice in our DNA, and we think everybody believes in that. So, so if we were talking about aging, we might use something like this on the left. Aging populations sometimes put pressure on the economic stability of our communities um, through increased government spending. But keeping people active as they age reduces overall institutional expenditures and allows them greater independence and voice in the community. So that's a social justice frame, that's nice, but it still uses the terms they and assigns the expense to aging populations as though we were not part of that population. So here's a reframe of that. Um, and, and excuse me, and what, when you say that, people think, oh, they're using my tax dollars again. It's another group of people that need my money. And they, they use this up and it won't help me. It creates this zero sum game mentality and an us them mentality. So instead of saying aging populations, you might say, as we age, 
It changes the pressure and economic stability of our communities. Keeping all of us active as we age reduces expenditures and allows us all to participate in society. And so you're using this inclusive language rather than us and them, and you're not using a zero sum mentality. So by creating a new narrative about aging, you make it personal. As we age, we accumulate wisdom. You're using social ingenuity. As a society, we're innovative in the United States. We're hardworking people who can seek solutions together. And the inclusive language is that together piece. Advances in aging benefit all of us. And truly they will, because if you go back to that that pillar that the pyramid has moved into, it is all of us as we age. So select different words, terms, and images. Use the term older adults and younger adults instead of seniors, the elderly, um, you know, the silver tsunami. Instead of talking about older people working or retirees, talk about encore careers. Instead of boomers, people born in the baby boom generation or the post-World War II generation, older generations, longevity, aging issues, not senior issues, intergenerational work. And by the way, that is a magic term and in many, many ways. When I've done some research and funded some programs on intergenerational work, and what we find is that when we get older adults working with young children, everybody benefits. The young children are calmer, they're more attentive, they're more able to learn, they're more loved and feel feel um, warmer and happier about their lives. Older adults have the same experience. They feel important. They feel that they can pass on what they have learned. And they also feel a connection to a generation that will outlive them and see the future. So it's, it's really a beautiful thing. Instead of um, talking about diabetics or people with hypertension as we tended to do during COVID, Talk about people living with diabetes, people living with chronic disease. We do that with HIV AIDS and we understand how important that is to make them people living with an issue. We don't reduce them to that issue. So I'm, I'm gonna wrap up here, but I'm asking you to rethink your own impressions of aging, be aware of your own feelings about aging and think about yourself on this journey. Think about yourself 20, 30, 40 years from now. Think of yourself as an aging adult on a continuous path, that the end is not now. The end is hopefully a very long time from now. And that if you think about aging and think about inclusivity and language and images and, and patterns that help to embrace aging and understand that it is all of us, you will begin to understand that ageism is really discrimination against your future self and what we will be as a society. Pay attention to groups that help to make change here. There are a lot of really active groups. Changing Aging and Age Queer both have these great um, endeavors to um, end ageism and create positive movement in aging. Um, the World Health Organization has an end ageism thing. In fact, age-friendly communities is actually a creation of the World Health Organization. The AARP has embraced that and has taken that over in the United States as age-friendly communities. California has a wonderful initiative, California for All Ages Frameworks. I encourage you to go to their website and look at aging and ageism. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement has embraced embraced age-friendly health systems, including public health systems. The Trust for America's Health has really embraced age-friendly public health systems. And in Colorado, one I just really love from my time working uh, with them is changing the narrative in Colorado. But there are many more. Massachusetts has a number of age-friendly initiatives. Pay attention to those, the language they use and how inclusive they are. So to end, I'll, I'll, I'll really end where we began. When we look at that, where will you be in 2060? If you're over 21 years of age, and you probably are, you're going to be above 60. You're going to be in these upper age groups. What do you want society to look like? What do you want to be doing at that age? And how do you want to be treated by the society that you create? And I'll end with this slide. Living old is nothing to fear. It's something to celebrate. We are the luckiest people on the planet to be able to live to an old age. So how do we take that knowledge and embrace it and include everyone in that? 
So thank you very, very much for that. And um, I, there are no questions that have been chatted in, but I invite you to send some and please uh, pay attention to what we're doing at JSI and aging and attention to the other groups that I've spelled out here. We hope to encourage all of you to think in the work that you do about aging and how to be inclusive in aging as you go forward. So thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you.